But today we'll build this old English country coffee table. But I must admit, there really is no such thing as an old English coffee table. It's a relatively new term. They didn't exist 100 years ago. But that doesn't stop your favorite English antique dealer from making one up for you. And we'll show you how they do that and how we made ours next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abel. Well, today we're in Polgate, a small town not far from Brighton, near the south coast of the UK. And we're at Graham Price Antiques. And I see Graham is back there checking out his latest shipment. Let's see what he has. Hi, Graham. Hi, Norman. Good to see you again. Good to see you. You know, I don't mean to uh, challenge your business sense, but, you know, a lot of this, to me, looks like it's ready for the tip. Well, that would be a silly thing to do, Norman. We've got uh, several thousand pounds worth of merchandise in the shipment here in this corner. Just in this corner, several yeah, thousand? Yeah, just a little bit. Wow. Well, you are the expert. <laughs> so what do you do with a chair like this? Well, not too much. The, the secret is to try and retain its age and uh, colors, but to stabilize it so as it doesn't deteriorate any further. So you want to show the rust, and covering it with a fresh coat of enamel wouldn't be quite no, right. That, that wouldn't be the thing to do. Now, what's this? Well, this is a, an iron flower stand for um, pots with flowers. And we'll keep the paint on this, but again, stabilize it. And That'll be nice in someone's concern. Yes, that's where it'll end up, I'm sure. As I've been searching around, I've been told that the little worm holes in these tabletops give it more value. Yeah, they're very desirable, these little worms. Mm. Now, Graham, seriously, you, you've got to be kidding. Look at this table. It's modern-day L brackets with yes, screws uh, put into it to hold it off Some time in its life, it's had a temporary repair, which has lasted a long time, but we'll have to <laughs> remove all that now and fix the joints. But for you, it's a valuable piece. It's a nice antique table. Yeah, well, it will need some work, I can say that. How about these clocks? Where do they come from? These are French again, long case clocks. We, uh, We'll be stripping the cases back to the natural wood and then restoring the movements. And you do all that on your location. All done here, yeah. Well, you've got plenty of tables in this shipment, which brings me to the point why I'm here. I'm looking for a nice coffee table. Okay, well, the first problem is, of course, there is no actual antique coffee table. We have to take a, an old table and reconfigure it to be a coffee table. Hmm. Perhaps one like this, where we'd cut the legs down. Um, but in this case, because we've got these interesting stretchers, we'd be lifting them up and remaking the mortise and tenon joint up higher. Well, I can see how you modify it, but, you know, this certainly isn't ready for anyone's living room. No, we've got a bit of polishing to do on that. Can you show me something yeah, that's done? Yeah, show you some through here. So do you get a lot of call for these coffee tables? We get more call for coffee tables probably than any other type of table. Hmm. So I guess it's good that you got that shipment because you can make quite a few there. Yeah, this is the one just finished, just come out of the workshop. Oh. So this was from the same shipment, and uh, yesterday looked the same as the one here. Is that right? Well, well, I can see how you cut the legs down. But the more I look at this furniture, the more I want to know about the finish, because that seems to be the secret. The secret to the finish is not to disturb the natural wear. Um, we never put the sander on them. If, if we just clean off all the dirt and then build up layers of polish. So the day before yesterday, this table looked like very this table. Very much like this one. You see the dirt here? Yeah. But basically, the, the surface, the finish of the surface won't change very much, just the color and the depth of the just shine. get rid of the grime and wax. Yeah. Is this some of your wax? This is some of the wax we Can I give it a try? Just, yeah, please. I want to learn how to do this. You rub it in. I can see right away that the wood starts to pick up its natural mm -hmm. color again. Okay, so now I'm starting to get it. The secret is in this wax. What is this wax? Well, this is a traditional beeswax-based wax, but uh, it's very good, but no different from one of a dozen others that might be used. You'll find that most restorers have their own preference for a wax, and there are many, many of the different ones that will do the job as well. And a lot of elbow grease, I suppose. A great deal of elbow grease as well. Yeah. Well, once the piece reaches its final destination, how does the owner maintain it? Just an occasional wax, once, maybe twice a year, no more and the light buffing will keep it in good shape. Well, this has been great. You've given me a lot of valuable information. And, you know, I think this table is just about the right size, so I guess I'll measure it up. Good. Hope so. Perhaps you'd like to finish polishing that before you leave. Okay. I'll give it a try. Okay. Let's get together for a little romance. Be nice. Kiss me. Let's get together for a little romance. Romance week on HGTV. Remember vinyl? Room size computers? That was then. Today, high technology is all around us, even in your kitchen. Introducing Wilson Art SSV for countertops. The look and feel of traditional solid surfacing, but slimmer. So SSV can cost up to a third less. Mm, now we have your attention. All the advantages without the high price. Wilson Art SSV. 
Join host Chris Cass and Madden and HGTV for the all-new Coastal Dream Home 99 special. We'll travel to Rosemary Beach, the Florida Gulf Coast's newest planned community, to have a look at the grand prize home featured in this year's HGTV Dream Home giveaway. We'll explore its construction, learn about the West Indies' influences on its design, even examine the unique challenges of coastal landscaping. See you at the beach for HGTV's Coastal Dream Home 99. Premieres Sunday, February 7th at 9, 8 Central. Well, you can be sure that before I left Graham Price Antiques, that I managed to separate him from one of his precious cans of wax polish. We'll be trying it out on our project a little bit later. Now, for the table itself, I like the antique so much that I really didn't change any of the dimensions. And the material of the antique appeared to be white oak, so I managed to go down to my hardwood outlet and pick up some of that. I've kept the tapered leg with the oak rail set flush, and the antique had a nice thick one-inch top, and I think that's real important to the look of the table. Now, this top is made from three-quarter inch boards with a quarter inch lamination underneath to give it that look of thickness. The top of the table on the antique, you might have noticed, you could see the individual board joint lines. They made no attempt to have it look like one solid piece of wood. So when I built our prototype, I put a little V-groove down to sort of make it look like a planked tabletop. Now, if you like the look of this table and you'd like to build one for yourself, we will have a measured drawing and a materials list available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. Now, before we get started, I want to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now, to get started on today's project, I'm going to take this length of 1 by 10 oak and cut three pieces 46 inches long for the top here at the radio arm. Okay, I'm going to flip this one over. What I want to do here when I line up the boards is alternate the growth ring patterns. As you can see, on this board, it's cupping up like that. On this one, it's down, and on this one, it's up. And by alternating those growth rings, I'm less likely to get cupping over the entire width of the top. Now, these boards, the edges are just as they came from my hardwood outlet. And you can see this one fits pretty good. This one, however, has a little bow in the middle. You see, it doesn't make contact on the end. Now, even though we're going to show these joints, in order to get a good, strong glue bond, these have to fit pretty well. So I'm going to run all the edges through the joint. If you don't have the room or the budget in your shop for a full-size shaper, you might consider one of these. This is really one step up from a router and a router table. It has a permanently mounted heavy-duty motor, and it takes router bits just like a router table, but in addition, there's an accessory spindle, which allows me to use these heavy-duty shaper cutters. Now, I've set it up today with a cutter that makes a glue joint. I'll show you what that is. That's this joint right here. The advantage to that joint is that unlike just a simple butt joint, which only gives you the three-quarter inch thickness of the board as a glue surface, if you were to add up all the ins and outs of this joint, you'd see there's a lot more glue surface, and also it prevents the boards from slipping by one another. It's an interlocking joint. I've also installed on the router table this feather board, and what that does is holds the wood tight to the surface, so as I push it through, it can't go up and down, causing an uneven joint. Now, we've taken a lot of time to make the glue joint on the edges of all these boards, so I want to make sure that I get a nice coat of this yellow carpenter's glue on all the surfaces. Okay, takes care of that. For now, we'll set it aside to dry and start working on the tapered legs. Well, here are four blanks for the legs. Now, I wish I could have obtained solid stock for them, but none was available. So I simply laminated two pieces of wood together and I end up with a blank that's about two and a quarter inches square. The first step is to scrape off the glue that's squeezed out. Two sides of the blank are perfectly smooth, but the laminated edge is a bit uneven. So what I want to do is put that smooth edge against the fence of my joiner, which has been set at 90 degrees to the table, and make a pass through. Now I have one corner of the blank, which is a perfect 90 degree angle, which is what I want for the next step. Using these two smooth surfaces as a guide, 
I'm going to remove material from this side and this side until I end up with a blank that's two and a quarter inches square using my surface planer. The rails are joined to the legs on the table with a mortise and tenon joint. So I've set up my stationary mortiser over here on the bench. And I'm starting to like this tool more and more because it's dedicated to doing one job, which means I don't have to set up my drill press every time I want to make mortises. So with everything adjusted and properly set and the layout done on the blank, I'm ready to make two mortises in each leg. Now to make the tapers on my legs, I'm using my store-bought tapering jig, which is just two pieces of metal that pivot up on this end, and there's a bar to adjust varying degrees of taper. There's a little stop on the back end against which I rest the blank. And the idea is to keep the whole thing up against the rip fence as I guide it through. Now, I've set it up so that the taper really starts about three and three quarters down from the top and just removes this wedge. I also want to keep in mind that the tapers are only on the sides with the mortises. At this precise moment, somewhere in America, a plastic container is out of control. The handle of a laundry basket is giving way, and a garbage can has just lost its battle with the bumper. To the owners of these pathetic plastic containers, Rubbermaid has just one thing to say. Na 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 na. Rubbermaid, ideas that last. I think the most important feeding is the one that you start in the fall, so your lawn starts to look healthier in the spring. And consequently, you need Scott's winterizer. When I put down winterizer in the fall, it allows us to develop a good, strong root base, and it allows the uh, lawn to endure the winter weather, and you get a real early greening. This grass is beautiful, thick, deep green. People will stop by and say, how'd you do that? Scott's winterizer gives the grass a kickstart in the fall and makes it really look great in the spring. If you can do this, you can make wood beautiful with Minwax. And if you can do this, you can give wood lasting protection. Turning a house into a beautiful home is as easy as turning to Minwax. If you can do this, you can make wood beautiful with Minwax. And if you can do this, you can give wood lasting protection. Turning a house into a beautiful home is as easy as turning to Minwax. Brighten your home and simplify your life with Valley window covers. Practical as well as beautiful, they provide complete light control and reassuring privacy. They require minimal care, so they look fresh and fashionable year after year. Valley's new collections include splendid new patterns, unique sculpted profiles, and dozens upon dozens of luscious colors. They're very easy to operate and guaranteed to last. Available at Lowe's and other fine home improvement centers nationwide. Got some in my bathroom. Exquisite, but... It's not me. Oh, cool. Contemporary. Ooh, la la, European. Now this is my bathroom. So elegant, so neat. The bath collections of Universal Rundle. We're the look you're looking for. The look of colors, deep and unique, soft and soothing. Whatever the look you're looking for, you'll find it here. Now here are the pieces for my rails. Two long ones and two short ones, cut for the right length. And they're going to fit into the mortises with tenons on each end. To cut the tenons, I've installed this guide block on the table saw fence, and the distance from this side of the block to this side of the dado head cutter is one inch, the length of my tenon. I've carefully adjusted the height and run a sample piece through. Now to double check my setup, and to make sure that the face of this rail is gonna be absolutely flush with the leg, I just turn it around, put the shoulder over the edge of the leg, and see if the face of the rail lines up with the inside edge of that mortise. And it does, so we're all set. Now we'll just run both ends of all the other pieces.
Now, before I go any further cutting the backside of those tenons, I want to check the fit. I just made a little cut on the end. Well, it's a little bit loose, so I think I'm going to lower the blade a touch. Yeah, that's what we want, a nice snug fit. Now, without changing any of the setup, except the height of the dado head cutter, which I've raised, I can now cut the top and bottom edge of the tenons by running the piece through on edge. Now, along the top edge of the rails on the inside, there's a groove, and that's for these little oak blocks, which will actually secure the top to the frame. Now, to make that groove, all I've done is narrow the dado head down to a quarter of an inch, just to the fence and the height, and I'm ready to run the pieces through. Well, now we're ready for some assembly. A little bit of glue in the mortises. Now, a little more glue on all surfaces of the tenon and the shoulders. Now, just a little bit of clamp pressure. Now, the holes for the dowel pins I'm making with a quarter-inch brad point bit. A little bit of tape to let me know how deep to drill into the piece. A little bit of glue on the dowel pin and in the hole I just drilled. And we'll put two of those on each leg. Now, the dowel pins are sufficient enough to hold the frame all together. But I'd feel a little bit better if I left these clamps on until the glue cures. I've just ripped my top to 26 and 1 16th inches. The final width is 26, so I'll trim a 30-second off each edge at the joint. Now, to trim the top for length, I'm just using a straight-edge clamp, and I've set it square to the long edge, and I'm simply going to use a circular saw to trim it off. Well, now I'm ready to start working on this detail. I need to make a tongue to fit into the groove that's going to be in the breadboard edge. So I've set up the table saw once again with the dado head cutter. I'm going to run both ends of the blank through, making sure to hold the face side down. Now that first pass for the top of the tongue is 3 eighths of an inch deep. Now, the rabbit on the bottom edge that forms the tongue is only an eighth of an inch deep. Next, the breadboard ends. I've already ripped them to the correct width, cut them to length, and they're actually made up of two pieces of laminated oak to be an inch thick. Now, I want to make a groove along the edge to fit over that tongue that we just made. Now, the tongue is about a little bit over a quarter of an inch thick, so I've set the dado head cutter to one quarter inch. I'll make the first pass, move the fence slightly, then make the second pass. Okay, let's see how this fits on there. Pretty good. Now, these holes in the edge of the breadboard are for some oak plugs. Next, I'm going to drill a hole all the way through, only at the center location, because there's going to be a screw there. I'm using a 3 16 inch bit. And finally, a small pilot hole for the threads of the screw. Now, we'll temporarily secure the breadboard ends for the next step. Now, that's the V-groove between the breadboard edge and the top, and I made it using my router equipped with the V-groove bit and the guide fence. Now, to make the V-groove along the length of the planks, I removed the breadboard edges and used a straight-edge clamp. This V-groove technique is one of the best methods that I know to conceal any unevenness that's between the boards.
breadboard edge is attached without using any glue, just the one screw in the middle. And that will allow the feel to expand and contract with changes in moisture. The holes that I drilled on the ends will be filled with plugs, for looks only. Well, now I can apply these little strips of oak along the edge, which will give me that look of the one-inch thickness. And now you understand why I offset that tongue when I milled it. Order a home video of the project you've just seen Norm build, complete with a measured drawing and materials list. Call toll-free 1-800-892-0110. The price is $24.95, plus shipping and handling. Get the measured drawing alone for only $10. The number again is 1-800-892-0110. Spectricide grass and weed killer works in 24 hours. The other brand takes a little longer. Actually, a lot longer. Spectricide works in hours, not days. That's why weeds can't hide from Spectricide. To you, it's your castle. To millions of termites, it's the all-you-can-eat buffet. But now there's new Terminate from Spectricide. Do-it-yourself termite protection for a fraction of the cost of professionals. Before it's too late, Terminate. For the sore, red nose, Kleenex presents the Better Lotion Tissue. Cold care with lotion. It's better than the other lotion tissue. Only cold care has the three-layer system, plus a moisturizing lotion made with vitamin E and aloe. Test brew of cold care is more soothing than the other lotion tissue. It's the better lotion tissue, so Kleenex cold care is all your nose needs. Nothing is more important than your family's good health, and now you can take care of yourself and your family the natural way, without synthetic drugs and prescriptions. It's all right here in the Journal of Natural Health. Each issue gives you page after page of important medical information in easy-to-understand terms you may not find anywhere else. Learn how to use herbs, vitamins, and minerals to ease the pain of arthritis naturally. Help restore health to an enlarged prostate. Sleep peacefully through the night. Cool hot flashes and decrease the mood swings of menopause. Ensure a healthy sex life. And ease the misery of colds and allergies, all without synthetic drugs and prescriptions. Call Toll Free to receive an entire year's subscription to the Journal of Natural Health. It's a $44 value, yours free. And when you call now to reserve your free subscription, you'll also receive $10 off toward your first purchase of any all-natural health formula from White Wing Labs. So call and order the Journal of Natural Health, yours free, right now. Now over on my bandsaw, I made these little clips out of some scraps of oak and pre-drilled a hole, and I'm using them in that slot that's in the inside of the rail to secure the top to the frame. And what it does is it still allows the top to expand and contract freely. Well, a little bit of final sanding on the top. I'll back the whole piece off, dust it, and we'll see about the finish. You might recall that the antique we saw in England was very dark. And we kind of like that look. So what I'm doing here is applying a coat of an oil-based stain that the manufacturer refers to as English walnut. We'll coat the whole piece, let it dry, wipe off any excess, and touch it up as necessary. Then I'll let it cure at least overnight, and then we'll put on some of that magic wax. Well, that stain job turned out nicely, and now I'm applying some of that wax. It's very dark in color because it contains a dark stain. And the manufacturer says that it has a high percentage of beeswax. As far as applying it, the instructions call for it to be applied with the grain, in a nice thin coat, let it dry for 15 minutes, and buff it out. Ah, look at this. See what's happening. The wood is starting to look richer and richer, and it's very smooth. You can't wait to see what this piece is going to look like with a half a dozen coats. Well, I'm really pleased at the way this table turned out. One coat of the English walnut stain and several coats of wax have really made the wood look rich. But wax is wax, so I'll have to give it regular maintenance.